Okay, hello everybody. I'm Dr. Nina Cunningham, and I just want to say welcome to another webinar given by Millennial Education Consulting. Thank you so much for coming out today. I just want to go over a couple of logistics before we get started. Uh, and you can see them on the screen. Uh, I'm hoping you can see them. I'm sure they're there. If not, just type in the chat box and let me know. As a matter of fact, the chat box is open and I want you to type in there your name and where you're from. So we'll have an idea as to who's on. And, and that chat box will also be there for you to ask questions. So as the presenter is presenting, go ahead and ask your questions in that chat box and we'll get to them as soon as uh, his presentation is over. Okay, you will remain uh, muted and your video, uh, your, uh, I should say your yeah, video is not seen by anyone just for your privacy sake. So, and I will continue to uh, let others in. Um, so why are we doing this protect your intellectual property? Well, if you think about this day and time that we're in, there are a lot of people who are trying to become self-employed and trying to become business owners. And they're just trying to do their own thing, brand themselves. Well, there are also those out there who would like to steal that from you. And so, Millennium Education Consulting feels like we should get the news out to everyone how to protect yourself to keep that from happening. So today we have someone who we know is totally qualified to tell us exactly what we need to do to keep others from stealing our hopes and dreams. So I would like to present to you the, I should say, attorney, uh, Bobby Robinson, the influencer attorney, and I'll let him tell you more about that, okay? I'm gonna stop my share, Bobby, and you got it. Thank you so much for that awesome, awesome introduction. Let me share my screen. All right. It's coming up shortly. Let me know if you guys can see my screen okay. Yes. Good. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, guys. Well, um, thank you so much. Uh, uh, as uh, Nina has uh, indicated, my name is Bobby Robinson. Uh, I am a corporate and intellectual property attorney um, at Nexon Pruitt. Um, and today's workshop is really all about uh, talking about how to protect your brand uh, in the marketplace, uh, what's protectable, uh, and so forth. Uh, just a little bit about uh, myself. Um, I am a corporate attorney uh, and intellectual property attorney. I represent um, startups, influencers, athletes, um, middle market companies, and I advise them on a variety of corporate and intellectual property matters. Um, everything from business formation, contracts, trademarks, and copyrights, which we will um, go over during this presentation. Uh, also, uh, a ton of work around FTC, social media endorsement compliance, um, which we may touch on a little bit, particularly for those brands who are wanting to maybe even use influencers or are promoting products and services um, on social media. Um, as with uh, any legal presentation, I uh, just want to let you guys know uh, uh, this, everything that I covered today is truly uh, educational uh, and intended to be informational. Um, this does not constitute uh, professional uh, advice, but if you do have some questions, uh, please feel free to uh, drop them in the comment box uh, and we will certainly uh, address them as needed. Um, a couple of takeaways that I'm hoping you'll get from this presentation is there's a lot of noise around intellectual property, uh, it, whether it be on social media, the internet. Uh, so we're going to clarify some of that for you today. Um, in particular, we're going to really do a deep dive on two types of intellectual property, and that's trademarks and copyrights. And, um, you know, we talked about people stealing your IP. We want to also make sure you're aware of 
um, the rights of third parties or other owners of IP so we can avoid uh, any issues uh, down the road. All right, so, so one of the things I think that um, a lot of entrepreneurs, particularly um, aspiring entrepreneurs, um, tend to overlook or not truly have an appreciation for is uh, the type of intellectual property that you may create. Every business, whether you have a product or a service, you have some form of intellectual property uh, that is deserving of some form of protection. Um, it, for example, for my clients who are coaches, um, they may have a proprietary curriculum that they want to protect. Or for my clients who are in the hair and beauty space, they may have a product um, that they want to protect. So um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, intellectual property is just your genius. Um, that, that intuitive, that innovative idea uh, around a product or service that's distinct in the marketplace from any other competitor is again deserving of protection and the beautiful part is um, you can protect it at various levels um, you can protect it on the federal level you can also protect it on a state level and if you have a global brand um, we would certainly need to look at uh, international trademarks or some other form of protection uh, before I move on, I think it's also uh, incumbent to know that when you own intellectual property, the beautiful thing about it is it's exclusive to you, right? Um, and so it allows you to exclude anyone else from using that IP without your permission. Um, and so it's, it's so important um, that A, you as a business owner have an appreciation for what IP is within your business, and then figuring out what uh, steps you need to take. Because too often I see a lot of clients will spend a whole lot of money uh, investing in all these fancy marketing plans, hiring people to run ads, um, doing a whole bunch of stuff, uh, but not protecting the IP. And before you know it, it's too late because uh, someone has already trademarked it and now you have to spend a ton of money, again, and effort um, in rebranding yourself. And so we'll talk about that too, uh, in terms of being very proactive about how you protect your brand um, in the market. So um, in terms of the importance uh, to the business, um, I, again, my concern is always, we have uh, companies, who devalue the importance of intellectual property. Um, but there are a lot of platforms who thrive on the access of folks' IP. So um, as a social media attorney, um, when we look at uh, you know, Instagram, for example, their whole platform is relying on your ability to give them access to your photos and your videos, right? If not, that platform doesn't exist. Um, so there are a lot of opportunity around um, making sure that your IP is protected. And, and the biggest thing is I want, if you take nothing else away from this presentation or this conversation is that um, your IP is an asset, right? So just like you have cash in the bank, you got big contracts or whatever it is, um, you have to view your intellectual property as an asset that you can leverage to generate revenue, right? So I have a lot of clients who, for example, one way we can generate revenue is that we can license the product. So once you uh, register the trademark or you register uh, the copyright, we can now license that to other parties because again, as I mentioned earlier, um, you are the exclusive owner of that trademark or, uh, or of that copyright. And because you are an exclusive owner, in order for someone else to use it, it gets one or two things. Either you give them permission to use it without a fee, or you give them permission to use it with a fee. 
and that's usually what we call a license. Um, so it's really important that you understand the tools in your toolbox as it relates to how you generate revenue. It shouldn't just primarily be from the sale of widgets or whatever you're selling. You should have multiple streams of income. And one of the ways is always trying to figure out how to leverage your IP uh, to do so. Um, if you're just starting out, your IP may be the only asset you have, right? So I think that, that imputes more importance on protecting the one main asset that you have if you're just starting out. So it's really, really important uh, that you have an appreciation for what IP you may be creating uh, in the business. Um, there are so many benefits as to, you know, once you've taken the step, you've, you've invested the money, you've hired a lawyer, you've done everything that you need to do um, now it's on me to go on offense when uh, someone infringes on your trademark, right? So if uh, you're surfing social media or you're Googling something and then you, a lie, you see something that uh, is, it, and it is an exact replica of your product or service, then I can send a cease and desist letter or I can also have Google or GoDaddy or whoever is hosting that particular website, take it down. So there are processes that um, you know, I'm fully trained in and experienced in to help um, address any infringement issues, right? So uh, when you think about taking the proper steps, then I, I then can step in uh, and do that. But it's hard for me to do that. And there's not much I can do, no matter how talented I am, uh, if you don't take the steps to protect it uh, on the front end. Um, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time here uh, to really walk through um, the different types of intellectual property. So as you can see, there are five types of IP, uh, the first being copyright, trademark, patent, trade secret, and right of publicity. Um, I always get questions around, well, what's the difference between a copyright and a trademark? Um, a, a copyright uh, is what we call, it, it's, a, it's a creative expression. So for example, uh, a photo, uh, a blog, uh, this presentation, uh, lyrics to a song, music, those sorts of things can be copywritten. Um, what it doesn't allow, if you own a copyright, um, you can authorize copying or display of it um, and you also should know that it, it lasts a very, very long time. So it's the life of the author plus 70 years. Um, or it could be 120 years from the time of creation. And after that time, it, it falls in what we know as the public domain, and then you no longer have exclusive rights to it. Um, I want to also point out that um, the moment that you create copyrights, the moment that you create it, it's protected. But it's also important if you want to sue someone for infringement that you file it as a registered tra uh, copyright rather with the copyright office. So registration is very, very important. A lot of folks will just stop at creation of the copyright, but they won't go the next step of uh, registering the copyright. So it's really important to do that. On the other hand, a, a trademark is a commercial identifier. So when you think about trademarks, uh, logos come to mind or a slogan, or you can even trademark a distinctive hashtag. Uh, so you have a significant array of things that you can trademark. The, the thing about trademarks is uh, you cannot create a mark that is confusingly similar to another mark. And I have some examples of that. Uh, later on. And the trademark can be protected so long as you're using it in commerce. So uh, trademarks have to be renewed every 10 years. And you have to notify the trademark office that yes, I am in fact still using this product and we have to provide evidence, whether it's a screenshot from your social media account, whether it's your website, uh, whatever it is, we still have to demonstrate to them that we are uh, still using uh, this, this mark. 
Um, you do have to register uh, the trademark, but it is not uh, required for you to sue, uh, which is different from uh, a copyright, right? So uh, the moment that you become a registered trademark owner, you, have, you are presumed to be the exclusive owner of it. Um, so you don't have to do anything beyond that uh, to demonstrate that someone may be infringing on your trademark. Uh, from a patent perspective, it protects inventions. Um, and inventions last for 20 years. Uh, after that, it falls, again, very similar to, to copyrights, it falls within the public domain. So you'll, you'll notice this a lot, particularly with pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals that are patented um, after the 20 years is up then you'll start seeing all these other generic drugs coming about thereafter once the patent has uh, concluded. Uh, certainly, you do have to register uh, patents. So trademarks and patents are registered in the same office, USPTO's office, and then copyrights are registered uh, in the Copyright Office with the Library of Congress. Uh, so that's a different office that handles copyrights. Um, the last two, you don't hear about them very often, but I do want to just briefly uh, give you some insight into them. Uh, so trade secrets are valuable information not known by competitors. Um, the two examples of trade secrets that many of us have probably heard of before is uh, the KFC recipe or the Coca-Cola recipe. Um, again, it, it, it has to be something of value uh, that you're trying to keep secret from your competition and you actually have to take measures uh, to protect it. If you notice down at the bottom, there is no place to register it. That's why you hear these little things about, hey, it's locked up somewhere, nobody knows where it is because there's no federal agency that you can file a trade secret with. But there, if you figure out that you do have a trade secret and someone violates it and we have to, to sue on it, we have to demonstrate that we met a certain standard to qualify it as a trade secret. Um, and then right of publicity, uh, it's also known as name, image, and likeness for those that follow sports. Um, uh, student athletes will soon be able to monetize uh, their name, image, and likeness, and it's really an IP issue. Um, and what they're really talking about is right of publicity, and that's the commercialization of an individual's persona. Uh, and what it doesn't authorize is the use of someone named image and likeness. And so that's what the whole NCAA issue is about. It's also important that uh, for my clients who they are the brand, not a product, but they are the brand, whether they are a speaker of some sort, um, when I'm negotiating contracts, most lawyers who are not um, sophisticated in intellectual property may not consider right of publicity. And that is something that I'm always uh, thinking of when it comes to the, the likeness of my client uh, that may be used in any other branding or marketing collateral. So, so that's an overview and your business may have more than one, right? So if I use the example of a vacuum, the, the mechanism in the vacuum may be patented. The name of the vacuum company may be trademark or the logo for the vacuum. And maybe the, the manual on how to use the vacuum is copyrighted. So you'll have, you may have more than one, it, they're not mutually exclusive. So when we're talking about your products or services, um, I have all five of these in mind when making sure that we um, protected uh, at every cost. And I saw some questions, or did I not? Just want to confirm. Okay. All right. So let's just take a quick deep dive into trademarks. As I mentioned before, trademarks are your commercial identifiers. So we see logos all the time. But some folks are not very clear about, well, what can I trademark? What, I, what can I not trademark? Um, so th these are just some examples of some very iconic brands that we all know and follow. Uh, so you can trademark, obviously, words. So you have Apple, phrases, 
very similar to McDonald's. I'm loving it. Um, Nike swoosh as a logo. Um, again, Coca-Cola actually trademarked the shape of the bottle. Um, so again, it's a commercial identifier. When you see that bottle, you instantly think about Coca-Cola. No one else has that bottle. Um, or it can be a combination of the all of the above, right? Um, so when we're thinking about your brand and how to protect it, it's really important uh, that we have an appreciation for what can be protected. Um, a lot of clients also always ask me, well, when can I use the TM and the R? So the, the TM is just a public notice. So you're putting the public on notice that you're asserting some sort of common law um, rights in the brand, right? So you can put TM on your trademark. Um, you can't use the R until it's federally registered. Um, so at that point in time, we move from TM to R um, just to let folks know that, hey, this is a federal trademark. I mentioned this earlier, um, and this is the classic, classic coming to America example um, in terms of can I create something that may be confusing, but I like the brand, right? And the answer is that is it's no, right? Again, um, you cannot create a logo or brand that's going to cause what we know as a likelihood of confusion. The, the trademark office will not approve your brand if it will cause a likelihood of confusion with an existing trademark that's already registered, right? And so the issue is from a policy perspective is that you don't want, you don't want to spend all this money, time and effort building up this brand and then somebody steals it or tries to ride your coattail and you get me, I'm thinking I'm patronizing your business, but I'm actually patronizing your competitor without knowing it, right? So it's really important that when you are hiring um, designers and you know, for their website or logo or what have you, it is really important that you make sure it's not causing a likelihood of confusion because if you come to me um, after you've spent all that money, I'm, unfortunately, I may, will likely tell you, you've wasted your money if you want to then try to trademark this. Um, so it's really important that you have a conversation with a trademark attorney or someone if that is the path in which that you intend to go, i.e. you want to trademark it down the road. Um, so that's trademarks in a, at a very high level. Let's really go through uh, copyrights. Uh, copyrights are, are a little bit simpler um, and straightforward. Um, the, the caveat to a copyright though is um, it has to be an original work of authorship, right? So you can't copy something uh, and then claim it to be a copyright. Um, the work of authorship, this is, it's really important, particularly when it comes to uh, entrepreneurs and business owners who are thinking about partnering with other businesses, um, that you be clear on who owns the IP, right? So when we think about authorship, if you co-author, um, then there's joint ownership in the IP. And then we have to decide if, hey, if party A wants to sell it, but party B doesn't, um, what do we do with that, right? So we have to address those issues when it comes to copyright, not just copyright, any co-developed uh, uh, intellectual property. Now, here's the thing that a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, business owners tend not to have an appreciation for. And, the, and here's what it is. So, Anytime you hire someone to create a copywritten item, let me, let me just use the example of you hire a photographer to do a branding shoot for your new brand or for your new product launch or whatever you're hiring them for. Keep in mind, the general rule is that whoever creates the IP, in this case, copyright, they own it. 
So if they click that button, it's their creative genius of how they held the camera, making sure the lighting is right, making sure all these other things kind of work so you, they can get the perfect shot. Um, you didn't do any of that, even though you paid them to be there and to do it. And so that's the general rule. And as everything in the legal profession, there are always exceptions to the exception to the exception. Um, so how do we then make sure I own it, given the fact that I hired this contracted photographer to do it? Um, and I'm going to talk to through uh, two different scenarios. So some of you at some point in time will hire employees. Um, and it's also important that these employees will likely be creating some form of intellectual property on your behalf. So the exception is that if they create it on your behalf, then you own it because it happened within the scope of their employment. However, if it happens outside of their scope of employment, then the employee owns it. So we have to be very clear about what's in the scope of their employment. So if you hired them as a photographer and they work for you and that's their capacity, then obviously you would own the, the photos. But if that's not the case if, and they do photo photography on the side and you want them to come in, they own those images. The other part to that is if they're an independent contractor, it's really important that if they are an independent contractor, they, they have their own photography business and you hire them, um, it's important that you have them sign what is known as a work for hire agreement. And a work for hire agreement merely just says, look, I hired you to do this work and in exchange for my money, I need you to assign and transfer ownership back to me, right? It's very, very important that you do that. And you do that for everybody that you're hiring to do anything for you. Even if it's an independent contractor agreement, I always include IP provisions that will say my client will own the content, right? Even if they paid, they paid you for it, they own it. So it's really important because oftentimes if a photographer gives you a contract and I'm just using the photographer as an example, um, most times their contracts are written as such as though they would own the IP and they would give you some sort of license to use it, right? So keep in mind that you need a work for hire. If you are hiring someone to do and to create any type of intellectual property on behalf of your company. Um, in terms of copyright infringement, again, uh, you need uh, permission, right? So uh, again, being on social media, um, I'm sure many of you have seen, um, you know, folks will put the little disclaimer up there, I don't own the, the rights to this music. Um, that is, many of us IP lawyers, we just laugh because that's, that's, a, that's IP infringement. If the, if the artist or the label or whomever owns that song, if they did not give you permission, that's technically infringement. Doesn't matter, I only use five seconds, 10 seconds, whatever. Um, it's still infringement. Now there is, again, here comes another exception. Um, there's an exception as we know it as fair use. And uh, fair use basically says, look, I'm not using it for commercial purposes. I only, um, I'm using it for educational purposes. I've only used a sentence or two. Um, therefore, I, you don't need permission, right? So the rule of permission goes away if it is an issue of fair use. Now you can't say it's fair use because you found it on the internet and you copied somebody's intellectual property. That's not fair use. And then turn around and try to sell it as your own. So um, be careful of that. Make sure your team is careful of it. And that, you know, even if you hire someone um, to do and design uh, IP work for you, 
make sure they're not infringing on someone else's IP to create your IP, because that could be problematic as well. Uh, very similar to trademarks where we have the TM, uh, copyright has its own notice as well. And again, it's just a claim of ownership. Uh, so anytime you are developing copywritten material, whether it's a proposal uh, to a client uh, or whomever, always make sure you have some form of copyright notice or confidentiality disclaimer or something signifying that, hey, I am asserting copyright in this material that I'm sharing with you. All right, so just a few takeaways. If you don't own it, get permission, right? Now, it doesn't just apply to you. It applies to anybody that works with you or works for you. Uh, let's just make sure we got what we need so we don't have any issues down the road. And then obviously, um, make sure your contracts are clear on who owns the IP. And if you think fair use applies, talk to an attorney before you get too far down the road. Um, I'm going to skip this slide um, and then jump here. So, so there are different ways to protect your IP. Um, obviously, uh, you want to address the IP ownership in your employment agreement. So if you're hiring a team, you want to make sure that you have an IP provision in there. If you're a consultant or you're hiring a consultant, make sure if that consultant is creating some IP on your behalf that again, you own it once that consultant uh, arrangement ends. If you have a supplier, again, same, same applies. If you're joint developing or collaborating or there's a sponsored research agreement and that happens a lot in the educational space, uh, again, be very, very clear who owns the IP. And I, again, um, license agreement, Licensing is somewhat clear that I own it and I'm licensing it to you, but sometimes because I'm licensing it to you doesn't mean I'm also transferring any type of ownership in it. Um, and so just be clear about that. And again, I can't stress the fact that you got to educate your team. I had a um, significant uh, agency uh, who was doing some marketing campaigns with one of the uh, NBA leagues and teams and they took down some images from uh, a website and with technology nowadays they can reverse engineer and figure out where those images are. Uh, needless to say um, those employees aren't there anymore um, and we had to work out a, a settlement, but it was a very complicated issue. Uh, and so it's important that your team knows not to just download random images. There are a lot of places you can get, you know, license free or, or pay a fee for the images or video. Um, so just make sure everyone's educated on um, IP. That is all I have. Uh, here's my contact information, and I know uh, that we will be around uh, for some questions. So, um, Anna, do I turn it back over to you? Uh, yes, you can. I'm I'm uh, looking for questions, and uh, I know people came in after we already had started. So, if you have a question, just start uh, typing it in the chat box, and then I'll, I'll read it for Bobby. But while we're waiting for people to type their question. First, I want to let you know, I know we have people from we have San Diego, Atlanta, Charlotte, there's uh, Indiana, Maryville, Gary, Indiana, and Illinois. I know that's on here. And those who came in after that, just type your name and let us know where you're from. That's great. So, Bobby, I have a question while, you know, I'm waiting yeah. to ask. Uh, when you were talking about who owns the copyright, the contracting, many a times, and I have done this too, you go to a Fiverr or Upwork and you hire a graphic designer. And there have been times when I've given them pretty much exactly what I want to go on there. But then there have been times I've just said what I wanted and said, okay, you know what, you put it together and then they'll keep giving me revisions until I like it. So is that, is it my property or is it theirs? Yeah. So, so that's a really good question. Um, and it's really subject to Fiverr's terms of use on their website. Um, and most times, 
neither of you own it. It's Fiverr who you're granting the license for to use use that type of IP, right? Every site is different. Um, Upwork recently changed their language. I saw a notification from them. I do need to go back and take a look at it. Um, but Fiverr, from what I've read previously, they will claim or assert rights in the IP that's exchanged on their on their platform. Oh, wow. That is good to know because I've used them quite a bit. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. Uh, so I have to figure out, somebody said, oh, that's a good question. I'll see something about Uncle Remus. Oh, that was, uh, I think it was in, re in reference to the McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I like that. I like that. Nina. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> Okay, anybody else with a question? We have a few more minutes. Uh, okay, I see I see you, Willie. I saw you earlier. Just type it in and know if you got it. Uh, so here's a question. Can you go back and have someone sign away their rights? Um, and in what way? Uh, let me hold on. Let me uh, go into participants. So maybe uh, Nia, I saw you. I'm gonna unmute you. I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself so you can explain that a little more. Uh, like after they already did the work. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they they may. It's always hard to go back and do anything, right? Because um, folks are, you know, it, I've I've been a part of way too many deals where it's like, hey, I don't told you all this stuff. Can you now sign this NDA so it covers all the stuff I just told you? And folks are like, no, you know. Um, and so most times people want to know, like, why are you asking me? And it, it gets them to thinking, like, obviously this must be very important, right? Um, and so yeah, it's it's very challenging and difficult to do. If they if they respect the relationship, um, they'll do it, right? Um, so, but it, it's it's challenging. Nevertheless. Wow. So before you start giving out any information, non-disclosure is a good thing. A non-disclosure, a work made for, for hire, anytime you engage, just again, understand like, hey, what am I engaging them to do? Right? And if, they're, if you're engaging them to create some form of IP, then okay, I need a work made for hire or I need to make sure I have IP language in my proposal or in my contract that will have them sign. Um, and then you'll you'll obviously be good there. Do you work with clients only in North Carolina or will you assist clients in other states? So yes, um, I am licensed in North Carolina. Um, most of my clients, I can represent corporations that are uh, formed in other states. I cannot represent other individuals. Um, I can also work on federal matters. So trademarks and copyrights are federal issues, not state issues. So I can represent you wherever you are on a copyright or a trademark issue. Really good question. But I do have clients in all over the place. Yes. So can you work with LLCs? Absolutely. So I represent LLCs. S corporations, C corporations, partnerships, all those. Uh, so yes, absolutely. Okay, anybody else? All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so Bobby, I know you had your information. I want you to, if you would put it back, share your screen with your information. And everybody, yeah. if you are interested in getting in touch with uh, Bobby, just, you know, take a picture of his, of the screen. So you'll have his information and, uh, and reach out. He's great. He did my uh, trademark for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was great. And I think an independent contract agreement too, I think. He my independent contract agreement too. I hire independent contractors. So there you go. There you go. Uh, yeah, he's, he's great, very helpful, and very patient. Okay, so there's this information, you all. 
you know, get it down, take a picture. And I want to thank you all for coming and thank you so much, Bobby, for taking this time. I know you're very busy. Thanks for having me. Oh, wow. Thank you. I appreciate you. And Bobby's from uh, North Carolina, too. That's why that question came in. <laughs> and Nia's from Illinois. But So when you get that Illinois number, that will be her, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, everybody think, oh, okay, do you rep? Wait, what is this? Do you represent clients? Something about videos, I think. Let me go back. Do you represent clients that, that do video shots or shoots of artists in the state of Indiana? Um, unless it, it trickles down to a copyright issue, then yes. Um, so Willie, I just probably have to get an understanding of kind of what it is. And typically, if it touches a specific state issue, then I would usually tap into local counsel if, if need be. Good question. Yeah, it is. Okay. Great. Okay, so we have this two more. Let's see. I do have a question about the cloud-based program that I am creating. I will call. Okay. That was uh that's from Alexis. And she's in San Diego. She will give you a call. Okay. Okay, great. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. You know, my goal is not to hold you long. We get. <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, you guys have a great evening. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Okay. You too, Bobby.